Welcome to our devotional study today. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to entering with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. And uh, as you're turning there, we know that the theme of um, the book of Titus is sound doctrine. And uh, we saw that we need sound doctrine if there are to be order in our churches. Uh, you know, we need things ordered the way that God wants them ordered. And now as we're coming into Titus chapter 2, we're going to find out that sound doctrine and Christian conduct go hand in hand. Um, it is not possible, you know, it's not just enough to know sound doctrine, but we must be at the place in our lives that it affects the way that we live our life. What benefit is it to know the right things if those things are not affecting us in our life today? And one of the dangers that, are, that is out there in, in many independent Baptist circles today is that we're strong on preaching sound doctrine, but we're but weak on applying it to life. And we must understand that we not only need to know the Word of God, but that it must be applied to our lives. We must adorn the doctrine of God, as it talks about here in the first 10 verses of Titus 2, 1 through 4. So let's read, or Titus 2, 1 to 10, rather, but let's read verses 1 through 4 uh, and look at them today. It says, Titus 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women, er, women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Uh, so as we come into these verses, we see here um, that this lesson here gives in sharp contrast uh, the false doctrine that was taught about in Titus chapter 1 of these false teachers and the sound doctrine of Titus. And we see that there is a sharp contrast here. And he says, uh, not only that we should avoid this false doctrine and call it out, but we need to teach that which is sound doctrine. That's why he says, after he's done talking about the section on false doctrine in chapter 1, he says in the beginning of chapter 2, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That word become in that verse means the things that are proper for, the things that suit false or suit sound doctrine. Uh, you know, proper Christian behavior is dependent upon sound doctrine. Uh, it behooves the God-called pastor to speak sound doctrine to the believers in order that they might, through proper co conduct, adorn the doctrine of God. How in the world is somebody going to live right if they have not been taught what is right? So uh, if we're going to have that proper conduct in our lives, then we need to be teaching doctrine that is fitting, doctrine that is proper. So it says here, um, but that speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, and uh, so as we think about this idea of, of sound doctrine and, and adorning the doctrine of God in our lives, uh, you know, we're talking about this whole idea of um, basically embellishing with honor the word of God. Uh, you know, we look at the Bible as a beautiful thing and we want to uh, not only understand what it says, but we want to live what it says. You know, friends, to live a hypocritical life causes the doctrine of God to be despised and to be rejected. Somebody can believe right, but if they are not practicing right, what it does is it brings them to the brings the the testimony of God to the place where the people say, you know what, if that's if that's what Christianity is all about and they see the way a person's living their life, then I don't need anything to do with that whatsoever. So as we come into verse 1, down through the beginning of verse 4, um, we see here the importance of the age of adorning the doctrine of God. In other words, the older people in our church need to be setting an example for the younger people of that which is godly, of that which is sound doctrine, and not only setting that example, but also teaching the younger generation, as we're going to see in these verses as well, what is sound doctrine and how that looks in daily life. Friends, it's not only important to know the truth, but we must live the truth in our lives. Notice the conduct of these aged men in verse 2. It says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So it tells us a number of things that need to be need to be characteristics of the aged men. And also, friends, this is this should be characteristics of all people, but here it's pointing out they ought to be characteristics of the aged men. 
first of all, the idea of sober to abstain from wine and alcoholic beverages and uh, is is how we know the word sober to be today. And um, indeed, that's what this verse is talking about. But it's also talking about a person that has a serious mind. Now, that doesn't mean they can't they, they can ever joke. But what it does mean is this. It's like they understand, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there is a time to joke. There's a time to be serious. There's a time to be to mourn. And this aged man who is seasoned in the things of God knows the difference between those times. Also, it says that he is grave. That word grave means to be dignified and respected for character. Um, you know, when people look at their lives, uh, they understand that they are, that he is a man of Christian, good Christian character, that he upholds the truths that are in the word of God, that he's just not giving lip service to God. He is giving life service to God. He is living in such a way that he is respected for the character that he has and that his character emulates that which God wants him to have. Then the word temperate, um, means to be self-controlled. Um, you know, he has a sound mind that is filled with the spirit, filled with the word of God. And as a result of that, he is self-controlled. He's self-controlled in, you know, the things that he eats, the things that he does, the things that he says, all of those things. And really a good self-control, and I'm not minimizing the responsibility upon ourselves, but a good self-control comes from surrendering to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, surrendering to the Holy Spirit of God that is living within you. And allowing him to control your emotions, allowing him to control your actions and your reactions and your words and your thoughts. And a good uh, example of a good, solid Christian man is one who is self-controlled. But then he's also sound in the faith. Uh, you know, he seeks to have opinions that are free from error. He doesn't just simply want to give you man's opinion or his opinion or his thoughts. When he answers you on something, he wants to give you the word of God. His doctrinal convictions are in accord with God's word. He doesn't say, believe this because this is what I believe. He says, believe this because this is what the word of God teaches. And this is where the word of God teaches it. And as a result of that, you can see that their doctrinal convictions are in accord with God's word. Then he says that he's a man of charity. Now that word charity uh, is, um, you know, many just refer to it today as love. And it is love, but it's more than that. It is a brotherly love, a, an affection for somebody like their your brother. It is charity describes the love of God. And friends, he is telling us that we just don't want to love with a love that is that mankind is capable of. We want to love one another with the love of God. And that is evident through this older man's life. And then we see the word patience. And that word patience simply means that he is a man that is steadfast and that he is enduring. And of course, as we look at those qualities, we can see that uh, all of these things are shown to us beautifully through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he gives us some con some uh, thoughts about the conduct of aged women in verses three and four. He says that the aged women likewise, or the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. Notice that verses three and four begin with the word likewise. Like the age of women, likewise. In other words, they are to have the characteristics of godly men plus what follows in verse 3. That they would be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to wine, teachers of good things. They are to be a people that are holy and in control of their tongue and their appetite. You know, how sad today that you see a lot of, of people are not in control of their tongue. And I'm not saying this to be um, slanted or whatever, but it seems like, it's interesting that this is mentioned with the women because it seems like this is predominantly a problem with the women. And he says, listen, a woman must be in control of her tongue. Do not be involved in gossip, tail-bearing, slander, any of that. Uh, you know, don't be the one that picks the phone up and tells everybody what's going on, but rather be a person that is holy and be a person that God wants you to be and be in control of your tongue. And then we see in the beginning of verse four, and we'll get into this deeper tomorrow, that they are to teach good things to the younger women. The men are to do the same. We not only need to know this stuff, but we need to be passing it on to the generation that comes behind us. Who are you mentoring right now 
and passing on the character that God wants instilled in them. Don't be blaming the young people of not being who they should be, especially if you're not willing to take one of them or more than one of them under your wing and to bring them along in the things of God. Have a great day.